thanks for coming this afternoon. I recognize people are busy and we're in the midst of uh, many seminars and lectures, so I understand people's fatigue. Um, I'm here uh, to introduce David. Um, David's working with Dr. Uh, Rachel Noel Frosch, and, and, and Rachel's teaching, so she didn't make it today. David Gonzalez is a Ford Foundation and UC President Postdoctoral Fellow in ESLAM and in the School of Public Health, where he's working with Dr. Marilyn Frosch in her Sustainability and Health Equity Lab. Dr. Gonzalez received his BS at the UC Davis mm -hmm. uh, in Evolution and Ecology, his master's degree at Yale School of Forestry where he undertook research on mercury exposure amongst indigenous communities on the Peruvian Amazon, interesting field work site. Um, Dr. Gonzalez finished his PhD at Emmett Interdisciplinary Program in Environmental and Resource, uh, Resources in Stanford University, where he undertook environmental um, justice and public health research on the oil and gas extraction activities in California and their effect on air quality and adverse reproductive health outcomes. This summer, Dr. Gonzalez will begin his appointment as an assistant professor in environmental health sciences at UC Berkeley School of Public Health. Congratulations. Thank you. Floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction and um, really hoping I've been here for two years and I've had really a chance to share my work with the Ethel community. I'm excited to do that. I'm hoping more people will watch this on, I guess, on YouTube or wherever, um, because I'm really hoping to continue to build bridges between Ethel and, and public health once I make that transition. Um, so today I'm going to talk about four different studies around my work on oil and gas and health and environmental justice and climate change in California, starting with, uh, I know this is a, an environmental science crowd. I am an epidemiologist, but I don't just do epidemiology. I want to share some of my work looking at air pollution, uh, downwind of organic gas wells in California, then talk about a new study we just had published a couple of weeks ago looking at distributed environmental justice or essentially uh, disproportionate exposures to organic gas wells in California among racially marginalized people. Spoiler alert, um, it's pretty bad. And then we look into the origins and what are some of the policies that could have led to the disparities that we're seeing in the present day, and uh, including policy on redlining. And finally, we'll talk about climate change and how that may be uh, an emerging threat for oil and gas infrastructure in the Western US and people that live nearby. Um, so U.S. and California in particular have a very long history of oil and gas production. And I really like showing this photo uh, because it shows just how wild this is. So this is a photo from 100 years ago in Los Angeles, in the Los Angeles area, showing a beach, people lounging next to a forest, a literal forest of oil wells in the background. Uh, this is Huntington Beach. And for over 100 years, California has been uh, one of the leading producers of oil and gas in the country currently the sixth largest oil producing state. So we tend not to think of ourselves as an oil producing state. At one time, Los Angeles uh, oil fields produced 20% uh, of the global oil supply. It's been on the decline recently, but continues to be a major part of the economy in certain parts of the state. And it's not been without its risks, uh, such as this oil field higher than this, uh, the town of Signal Hill, which has been uh, nested in Long Beach in Southern California. Um, no secret that oil and gas production has hazards like this, as this photo shows. And residents as early as the 1920s, living on the front line of oil and gas production, were calling attention to this and asking for protection uh, from oil and gas production in their neighborhoods. Um, but it's continued to today uh, that we are drilling and operating oil and gas wells near places where people live, work, go to school, and play, such as in this community that's called Oildale. So it was a place uh, just north of Bakersfield, about 100 miles north of Los Angeles. And you can kind of see what it looks like in California in the, in the modern day. And the eastern part of the uh, image, um, well, it's kind of the western part. The western part, schools, residences, playgrounds, businesses. And the eastern part uh, is the Kern River oil field, which is the fifth largest urban oil field in the United States. This is what it looks like from the ground. 
uh, and back from a nearby park. Over 2 billion barrels of oil have been produced in this oil field, and about a half billion barrels remain underground. And this is what Signal Hill looks like today. So where we saw that image of the oil well on fire, this is what it looks like today, um, where there's oil fields that continue to be drilled and operated in areas uh, where people are living. And in fact, this is a not a small problem in the US. Across the country, we have 17 million people live within one mile of oil and gas wells. And in California, we estimate that oh, about 1.1 million people live within a kilometer, about 3,200 feet, uh, 3,300 feet of uh, active oil and gas wells, predominantly in Kern County, which is right there, southern part of the San Joaquin Valley, and also in Los Angeles, where they just were. And I first became interested in this because I grew up here um, on the border between Santa Barbara and San Luis Obispo counties, in an area uh, that has a cluster of oil fields, including the Guadalupe oil field, cited the largest oil spill in California, larger than Exxon Valdez. It happened for 40 years. And in fact, as UC Santa Barbara professor wrote a book about it called Silent Spill, mm -hmm. which I saw when I went to college at UC Davis and learned for the first time that there was, in fact, this massive oil spill in my home area. So it's always fascinating to me the extent of the damage that has been rendered by this industry and the fact that people in California have been exposed to it without really knowing how it's gonna impact our health. And in fact, when I started my PhD at Stanford a few years ago, there were no epidemiological studies in California that looked at whether it was safe to drill and operate oil wells in places where people live. So that's what I did uh, for the first half of my dissertation. Um, and we published this paper, uh, one of the first two papers, the other paper came from uh, Rachel's group, in fact, uh, the same week as our paper was published, but we worked independently. Uh, but both studies got at the issue a little bit differently, but came to similar conclusions. Living your oil, oil and gas wells in California is associated with higher risk of average birth outcomes, including future birth and impaired fetal growth. And we haven't only seen this in California, we've seen this in other states as well. I'm not going to get into this study, I'd be happy to talk about it if you have questions. Uh, but I just want to go through, this is something we've been uh, thinking about and publishing on for several years. I will be talking about this study where we found higher concentrations of air pollutants downwind. And then as I mentioned, we want to talk about the historical legacy of why we see uh, racial and socioeconomic disparities in exposure to oil and gas wells today. This is the body of work that I've been contributing to. As I mentioned, there's a broader body of literature on this topic in California and indeed across North America and some parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. And looking at this evidence, a panel uh, hired by the state, uh, California Oil and Gas Public Health Rulemaking Scientific Advisory Panel, which uh, actually Professor Merrill Frost and uh, Seth Donkoff, who is an alum of Berkeley and affiliated with UC, uh, the Public Health School. This team of researchers, myself included, contributing this report, looking at the evidence, concluded that there is a causal association between living your urban oil and gas wells, or indeed, not just urban oil and gas wells, rural as well. Living your oil and gas wells is causally associated with elevated risks of adverse birth outcomes and adverse respiratory health outcomes. And it's, I would argue, possible if not likely that there's causal associations with other adverse health outcomes that we simply have not had the time to study. So hopefully, Am I seeing this? Wow. Oh, thank, thanks, Kenzo. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm moving the chat to my screen, so it's not in front of everybody. Appreciate that. Um, so let's let's get into it. So hopefully I can let you that there's a good body of evidence, epidemiological evidence, finding that there's harm associated with living your urban oil and gas wells. I want to talk about um, some of the work, specifically starting with this oil and gas air pollution study. And this study was following up on our pre birth study where we found that living your oil, urban oil, or living your oil and gas wells in the San Joaquin Valley was associated with higher risk of pre birth. One of the questions that emerged from that is, what about living your oil and gas wells is harmful? What is the agent? What is the chemical agent that might be mediating this impact? So we sought to answer that question by looking at air pollutants that we know cause pre birth, such as uh, fine particulate matter, P2.5, and ozone. So we asked, to what extent does drilling new wells or increasing production in existing wells increase concentrations of these pollutants and other pollutants in California? And 
At what distance do we see decay to background levels? Essentially, how much and how far? We got data from the EPA air quality system on daily pollutant concentrations at monitors across the state between 2006 and 2019, including, so these are regulatory monitors typically used for regional air quality measurements. Um, but we set them up in a quasi-experimental design that I'll explain in a moment. Um, but there's over 300 of these monitors throughout the state that report their data to the EPA air quality system. They're represented here by these triangles across the state of California. I'm also showing you the different air basins. So we have different air basins, San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District being one of the primary ones with urban oil, oil and gas wells. I keep saying urban. <laughs> urban, I just mean oil and gas wells in general. And throughout our study period, uh, 06 to 19, over uh, nearly 40,000 wells were drilled during the study period across the state and these areas marked in orange here. And then over 90,000 wells were actively producing oil and gas during this period. So as you can see, about a third of the monitors were near oil and gas wells, and that's great. We wanted some of the monitors to be exposed, some of them being unexposed, means we can look at secular trends, trends unrelated to oil and gas production. Um, so throughout the study period, there were flexible, there were some temporal variation in terms of pre-production activities of wells. So spudding or starting to drill new wells or completing, finishing the construction of wells so that they're ready for production, or in some cases, re-completing wells and doing additional work at the wellhead. So the activity was ongoing, but declining as was overall production throughout our study period. So production averaged been a few hundred million barrels of oil per year. Throughout, uh, throughout the last 20 years in California. Ultimately, it's been on the decline, uh, but there's still hundreds of millions of barrels being produced every year in the state. So uh, in this study, we, as I mentioned, we used a quasi journal design. Uh, there, was, uh, there was an economist who was the lead person on this, but I'm gonna be using some econometrics language here. We used wind direction as an instrumental variable or a plausible source of exogenous variation. Essentially, we don't think that oil and operators are looking at which way the wind is blowing when they're making decisions as to whether or not to drill. And likewise, we don't expect other local sources of air pollution to be looking at the wind direction. Um, but I want to show you what this looks like. So this is real data from a real monitor and a, a triangle. Um, and those X's indicate different drilling sites on a particular day in July 2009. So it's just to illustrate our data. And we were interested in counting how many oil and gas wells were being drilled or what is the volume of oil and gas production upwind of the monitor. So here the wind on that day was blowing from the northwest, represented by that arrow. So that upwind quadrant in blue, those are monitors, or those are oil wells rather, that were upwind of our air monitor. And you can imagine some days the wind is blowing from the, that direction and there's well, wells being drilled. It takes a couple of weeks to drill wells. Some days there's no wells being drilled. Some days when it's going from a completely different direction altogether. Uh, we also were interested in, well, we don't think, if we're using wind as an instrumental variable, we don't think that the wind uh, that wells downwind of the monitor is contributing pollution. That's sort of the setup here. So, upwind wells, we expect to contribute pollution. Downwind wells, or our placebo test, was this a good instrument or not? So, we looked at, we counted the number of wells upwind, the number of wells downwind as well as the total volume of oil and gas produced. And again, I just want to show you the extent of this. Each of these circles represents a different act of producing oil and gas oil in the day in July 2009. Uh, and this monitor was situated uh, in a neighborhood. So this approximates the kinds of exposures that people might experience. And uh, again, this is actually from oil day, all that picture I showed you earlier. Then we fit this big fixed effects linear regression model, which I'll walk you through just to give an illustration of how we set this up. Uh, so we were interested in pollutant concentration for five different types of pollutants, including PM and ozone. On uh, particular, and we're looking at the monitor day. So unit of observation with each monitor on each day. We counted how many wells were upwind on each monitor in each day within each annulus, which is a fancy word for donut. So each of those different rings out, uh, out, out from the wells, so different bins of distance from the wells. We also, in the model, had the number of wells that were downwind, so we're adjusting for that as well. We have wells that were orthogonal on the side, and we're just one of them in the model. We weren't really interested in them. Um, we had a bunch of covariates, but plenty in a moment. 
an inflict effect for monitor year and um, day of week. I don't want to get into the details. Have to go into detail if you'd like, but essentially each monitor is serving as its own control. So we're comparing monitors to themselves on days when the wind was drilling, or what wind was blowing from drilling sites or active wells to days when it was not. Fixed effect control for features that vary by geography between different uh, air basins. There's different trends within different air basins. There's seasonal trends in pollution, more ozone in the summer, with more sun. For example, and then year to year trends, maybe in aggregate pollution levels are going down because of, you know, we have a great air regulatory board in the state. So we're trying to control for all that and really isolate the effect of drilling wells. And then we're also controlling for meteorological factors, rain, temperature, wind speed, and smoke plumes as well, because we know that's a major source of PM. And then essentially we're getting the marginal effect of drilling one new well or producing 100 additional barrels of oil equipment. About the average daily production at an oil well upwind of these monitors. And let me show you what we found. So, uh, what I'm going to show you is our results. On the y axis here is uh, the concentrations of PM2.5 in this case in micrograms per meters cubed. Uh, maybe you're not used to thinking about PM2.5 in micrograms per meters cubed. Maybe you are. Um, a relevant exposure, well, it really depends on what you're interested in. Um, but studies have found that, for example, as small as a one microgram per meter cubed increase in PM2.5 concentration over uh, a year or longer could have, so chronic exposure to as much as one additional microgram can have adverse health effects, for example, COVID. Um, so I'll show you our estimates for each of these different spins. So we'll have a different estimate and then confidence interval for zero to one, one to two, two to three kilometers, et cetera. This is what we found. So drilling new wells increased PM2.5 concentrations upwind, or sorry, <laughs> upwind, downwind, downwind, and in, in increased downwind concentrations of PM2.5. So when there were wells being drilled upwind of the monitor, we saw higher concentrations of PM2.5. Why, you might ask, don't we see, uh, don't we have an estimate for zero to one? That is one of the downsides of having a quasi experimental design. We didn't place these monitors, they were placed by different local regulatory agencies. Um, there were not enough wells for us to get an estimate there. Uh, but we feel pretty confident that we saw uh, what we expected, a signal of higher concentrations declining with distance, as far as three kilometers down one of these wells. How about that placebo test? As expected, when wells were drilled uh, at any distance downwind of the monitor, we did not see an increase or any substantial changes in air pollution concentration. So this gave us some confidence that what we're seeing, um, I might argue, is a causal effect. Uh, you know, we need more studies, of course, but this was uh, as careful as we uh, could get with the data that's available to us. Great. So we saw similar things for ozone, except ozone, uh, we saw more of a pulse of downwind, which is not necessarily unexpected. There's volatile organics and nitrogen dioxide chemicals that are known ozone precursors. And at the average wind speeds that we expect in California, it would take a couple kilometers of travel for those chemicals to be converted into ozone. So we don't expect ozone to be directly emitted, but a secondary pollutant produced downwind. And that's what we saw. And again, in the placebo, but they're not showing, we don't see this increase. And I'll just leave it at that for now. Um, so that both drilling new wells and increasing production of existing wells increase downwind air pollutant concentrations for PM2.5 ozone and three other criteria air pollutants that we looked at, as far as four kilometers downwind. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, this bolstered our confidence in our epidemiological studies. Like, okay, we're, we're seeing that living near oil and gas wells is associated with high risk of adverse birth outcomes. And now we have a chemical agent that is known to be associated with those outcomes. So it's another piece of the puzzle. And uh, future studies could undertake more granular looks at the data. We could use new sources of data like purple layer, which is some people are doing right now. Um, lots of ways to get at this. So but this is a way that we try to use existing publicly available data. Um, I know there's a lot on here. I might not get all of it, but let me let me just talk about this new study because this one just came out and I'm very excited about it. Um, though the news is not great. 
So do the question that we we're asking in this study was whether racially or socioeconomically marginalized people in California are more likely to live in places with oil and gas wells. And were these persistent through time? So a lot of times we'll do environmental justice, like exposure studies, uh, just look at one point in time. Here we wanted to look throughout time and see if these uh, associations were consistent. We got data for three different time periods, data, demographic data from the US Census for 05 to 09, 10 to 14, and 15 to 19. So three different time periods, um, average demographic data for each of those time periods. Coming from the American Community Survey, which is an ongoing survey that the Census Bureau does. Um, so we've got data at the block group level, so that's like neighborhoods, 600 to 3,000 people, on um, the racial ethnic makeup of these neighborhoods, and then socioeconomic indicators, including people living below the two times poverty rate, living in rent or occupied buildings, having less than high school education, being linguistically isolated, or being non voters, the people that didn't participate in the 2012 or 2016 presidential elections. All these different indicators of socioeconomic marginalization. Um, I'd be happy to go into the details if you are curious about it, but essentially um, something we think about as epidemiologists quite a bit, environmental epidemiologists, and of course in these spaces is how do we measure exposure to oil and gas wells? Well, if it's a pregnant person at a particular address and we know that they were living there throughout their pregnancy, uh, it's pretty easy. We just look at how many wells were within a certain distance of that address with the simplifying assumption that they're only exposed to their place of residence, which of course is not true. That's the best that we have available. For this study, we're looking at the unit of observation is that neighborhood, so the census block group. And we essentially use spatial methods, a lot of GIS folks in the room because this is at them. They're just taking, we know where the oil wells are, we know when they're being drilled, operated or retired. We buffer those wells out by one kilometer, and then we look at the overlap between those buffers and the and the uh, block group, and make the simplifying assumption that, as we all know, everyone is equally spaced within their neighborhoods. Obviously, that's not true. So we're making some simplifying assumptions. If we could go in with building data and data metric data, we'd get more fine tuned with it. I know some folks in this department are doing some great work there. We just said if ten percent of the block group is covered by this buffer, ten percent of the people are exposed. But we also wanted, that's just a binary exposure, yes, no. We also want to see how much exposure was there. So we counted the total production in all active wells within a kilometer of the central area. And that gave us a sense of not only are people exposed, yes, no, but how much? Because of, as we saw earlier, higher, uh, more production was associated with more pollution. We wanted to see if, if we saw any disparities in terms of who's exposed to uh, the most intensive oil and gas production. <clears throat> then we calculated a group risk ratio. Um, it really isn't that complicated. I can walk through this. I totally failed to do this last time I talked. So all you need to know really is that the risk ratio is greater than one, then we would say that groups have disproportionately high exposure or they're overrepresented among people that are exposed to oil and gas wells. This is not complicated. I just don't think it's necessary to walk through the math, but I hope to invite you to. Uh, risk ratio of less than one means disproportionately low exposure. Risk ratio of one means neither high nor low. And let me just show you what we found. So uh, again, I'm going to show you the results on the y-axis is our risk ratio. Greater than one, disproportionately high. Less than one, disproportionately low. And then we have our three different time periods to see if we're seeing consistent or time trending um, disparities. And what we saw uh, was now, black people in particular were disproport had disproportionately high exposure or were more likely to be in areas with new wells or drilling sites throughout the study period. So for that 15-year span, disproportionately high exposure, uh, Hispanic Latinx people in the later two time periods, American Indian Latinidas, the middle time period, um, wells are being drilled pretty much all the well, not all the time, but as we saw, there's some variation there, but they're being drilled consistently, but the drilling period is pretty short. Wells tend to be active on the order of years or decades. So what we saw uh, for that was more stable. So um, Black and Hispanic Latinx people uh, had disproportionately high exposure to active oil and gas wells throughout the study period. That's again, just any exposure, yes or no. Um, 
for rent, we also tell our renters, non voters, people living in poverty, a disproportionately high exposure. Obviously, these constructs very likely correlate with one another and with racial marginalization. We would love to get into that in future work, but we did not get into that into this study. Um, but we saw this pretty consistently uh, for active wells as well. So it seems like these indicators of socioeconomic marginalization are telling us that wells are more likely to be drilled or operated in areas with uh, low income people. And then let me get at this result here. So what we were interested finally with that last question, I actually don't even think I posed it yet. Um, do we see the same disparities or wider disparities in areas with more intensive oil and gas production? So for this assessment, we only looked at all the neighborhoods that had greater than zero production. We divided those neighborhoods into quintiles, five groups from quintile one, meaning uh, the lowest, you know, lowest production quintile, uh, quintile five, the 20% blockers with the most intensive production. Um, and when we looked at that, we estimated odds ratios. So for Hispanic Latinx people in 15 to 19, the most recent time period, uh, we saw that we saw this proportionate high exposure in the lower quintiles. But the result that uh, stuck out to, struck out to me was uh, we saw the widest disparities for Black people living in neighborhoods with the most intensive oil and gas production. Risk ratio of uh, about two, approximately two, which means uh, the proportion of Black people living in neighborhoods with the most intensive oil and gas production is two times the proportion of Black people across the state of California. Um, and you can see this almost monotonic increase with more production meaning wider disparities. So we saw that Black, Hispanic, and uh, socioeconomically marginalized people persistently had disproportionately high exposure oil and gas development, and the widest disparity for, for Black people and neighborhoods with the most intensive production. Uh, that brought this question of, uh, I don't have time for this, why not? Uh, redlining. <laughs> um, have you all heard of this a small group here? Have you heard of redlining? Seeing some nods, I can't see the digital people. Um, but we I think we might have seen these maps before because this has become very timely and virtually in fact at the center of this kind of research, which is one of the reasons I did it when I came here to the postdoc two years ago. So uh, redlining set of policies that happened in the middle part of the 20th century. One data set that has redlining data is this data set from the Homeowners Loan Corporation. These maps made in the 1930s and 40s where they graded neighborhoods uh, from A and green to like best to D, uh, red neighborhoods that they call hazardous. We know that uh, even controlling for income and the value of the housing stock, uh, if there were more people of color or more immigrants, there was uh, neighborhoods were more likely to receive a, a poorer grade or a worse grade. So we know that racism is baked in. Um, and let me just like illustrate this for you. So this particular neighborhood in Los Angeles um, was described as a melting pot and thoroughly blighted with a population uniformly of poor quality and a fit location for a slum clearance project. Uh, and I know that this was never cleared because my family lived in this neighborhood for uh, close to 100 years. And they were not poor quality people, but very high quality people. And when my, at the time in the 1930s, when redlining happened, my Mexican immigrant great grandmother and my grandpa uh, were living in this city or in this part of the, the city and uh, subjected to this, which was fascinating when I, I learned this throughout the course of this study. I was just like, hey, dad, where did your grandma, where did your grandma live again? Oh, wow. Um, it was interesting to see the personal connection to that. The other interesting thing about these uh, redlining maps is the oil fields are already on these maps. As I said, uh, as I said in, in LA in the 1920s, that's when uh, the oil boom really took off in California. Thinking back to those black and white pictures I showed you a little while ago. Uh, so this is the Baldwin Hills uh, producing oil field. Today it's the Inglewood oil field, which is the largest urban oil field in the United States. And as you can see, it is now a very densely populated part of the city. So in this study, we're interested in seeing was getting worse grade from the Homeward Loan Corporation red line associated with more deciding more oil and gas wells in these red line neighborhoods. And the interesting thing we could do for this study is we had data on wells drilled as early as the 1890s. 
So we could see, obviously, there's caveats galore about like who digitizes that. Um, but we had some data where we could look back before redlining occurred to see if neighborhoods that went on to be redlined did those well, then those neighborhoods had more oil wells. So we use this uh, great digitized data set from the University of Richmond. We got um, use a study design adapted from earlier work where we used 1940 census data. So we can do some matching and try to look at, you know, more causal answer where neighborhoods that look similar, but they're more likely to, uh, but had discordant treatments, receiving a D grade versus a C grade. What is a D grade more likely to receive oil wells? We have data from Inverus. This is all the cities that made it into our study that fit our criteria, cities with redlining maps and with oil and gas wells. And the labeled cities have census data from 1940. They haven't digitized all that census data, uh, unfortunately. So we just looked at how many wells are in these neighborhoods, what's the density, what's the count, um, at any time before and after redlining occurred from this particular data set. And then we use propensity score restriction matching using those 1940 observables. So like I mentioned earlier, match neighborhoods. And we just counted the wells that were like inside the neighborhoods and just outside the boundaries. And what we found was um, there's more oil and gas wells where they were concentrated in these degraded red line inputs. So again, this sort of staircase, poorer grades were associated with more oil and gas wells. This is full of count. We saw similar things with density as well. And neighborhoods that went on to be redlined, there was a concentration of oil wells as well. So the degraded neighborhoods, of, uh, the wells built before redlining occurred in each city, there were more wells there. Which again, it gets at this chicken and egg question. Redlining is not the first policy to create segregation. Um, and if anything, this raised more questions than it answered for me. And then since redlining occurred, uh, again, we see more wells are, have been cited in areas that were historically redlined. Uh, we did propensity score matching. Hopefully, we'll trust that we did it well. Uh, and what we found was that uh, looking at these dyads, so comparing degraded neighborhoods to matched C graded neighborhoods, we saw that neighborhoods that received that worst grade had consistently more wells than them. So, degraded neighborhoods had on average about two additional wells than neighborhoods that were graded C. Um, that were matched and restricted. So again, we're looking at this in all these different ways. We're seeing this consistent association here um, using targeted, this is from targeted maximum likelihood estimation, estimation models. Um, and we saw the same thing again in neighborhoods that went on. So even in our matching procedure, the neighborhoods that went on to be redlined, there were more oil and gas wells in those neighborhoods um, that received a P grade than comparable C graded neighborhoods. So we saw oil wells concentrated in historically redlined neighborhoods, worst grades from the homeowners own corporation were associated with additional oil and gas wells, which might explain findings from other studies that have found higher concentrations of, for example, air pollutants in these neighborhoods, um, and before and after redlining. Which gets us to uh, the modern day and modern day problems. So in just a few minutes here, I want to get to the study that we're wrapping up right now. Um, so we know that, and there's sort of a circularity to this, we know that oil and gas production is driving climate change. Production and use of oil and gas is driving climate change, which in turn is driving wildfire risk. The question is, um, is that also is that coming back in, in affecting oil and gas infrastructure, specifically oil wells in the Western US? Uh, so we're looking at how many oil and gas wells have been located while fire burning areas. This just, this just came from, a colleague mentioning a, a Colorado wildfire that happened to be near some oil wells. I'm like, how big is this? A, is this something we should be worrying about? Like, we hear this anecdotally. Let's take a broad look at this. How many wells are in these areas? How many people are near these wells? Is it going to get worse in the future? It's sort of like, let's scope this out. Let's see if this is a problem. So we got data from these 19 states in the Western U.S. And this map shows in red wildfires that have occurred between 1984 and 2019. And in gray, those are one kilometer buffers around the 1.7 million oil wells in this region. So you can just kind of do the visual regression here. And you can see, like, look, it looks like there's some fires happening in areas with oil wells. Obviously, there's some tiny, maybe the wells are drilled, that kind of wells happen, or the wildfires happen. Um, but visually, I'm mean, just kind of getting a sense of. Looks like we might be onto something here. So we got all this data. 
Uh, how do we go into the details? But essentially, what we saw, what we found was um, about 100,000 wells in the past 40 years have been in areas where wildfires have occurred. 100,000. And we see this trend of increasing numbers. Obviously, it's very sporadic, uh, but we see this increasing trend. Generally, we're seeing more wells and wildfire burn areas as time goes on. And we're seeing more people exposed as well. So we estimate that in aggregate over the past 40 years, about 350,000 people have lived within one kilometer of oil wells that have been in wildfire burn areas. What does this mean for them? That's a great question and one that we're going to try to ask um, because it's unclear to what extent we should worry about this. Maybe operators are on it and uh, taking care of any potential hazards. Maybe not. And maybe there's uh, pollution risk uh, for the people. And of course, for ecosystems and wildlife as well. There are these wildfires, well, oil wells and wildfire areas. I haven't seen anyone publish on this yet, um, but what I have seen is like generally fire and oil don't mix. There's generally five <laughs> engineering papers I've read to not have uh, flames in oil fields. Um, but again, we're not really getting a sense of, of um, how this might impact people. I'm not trying to be alarming, but just trying to ask these questions and, and be informing. And the other reason that we're curious about this is, as I mentioned, we're looking at in the past 40 years, we're seeing a trend of more wild wells and wildfire areas and more people exposed to them. We used um, this keach byron drought index, which is an indicator of uh, wildfire risk, um, to look into the future and project how many oil wells do we expect will be in wildfire burn or wildfire high risk wildfire areas as climate change progresses. Uh, so the uh, pink here is areas that have a KVDI of over 600. So that's um, by the paper that we're citing um, and by others, uh, an indicator of a high wildfire risk area, a very difficult to, to control wildfire that occurs under those conditions. So you can see in uh, the areas where that's expected, this is the current, well, 2017, current enough, uh, areas with high wildfire risk and where those oil and gas wells are. And of course, Areas with high wildfire risk are expected to grow uh, through the 20th century. So we estimate that uh, depending on the cutoff you use. So if we're using a cutoff of 600 KVDI, we estimate that there's about 120,000 wells in high wildfire risk areas in the present day, including many wells in California, as you can see in this map. And we estimate that by the end of the century, over 200,000 wells will be in high wildfire risk areas. If we use, uh, if we change the scale a little bit, we say, let's look at a KVDI of 450. Let's use 450 as our threshold, which agencies like the U.S. Department of Agriculture use as their indicator of wildfire risk. The numbers expand quite a bit from there being 600,000 wells currently in high wildfire risk areas to over 1.2 million wells in high wildfire risk areas by the end of the century. And again, it just depends on what your threshold for risk is. So we're seeing these trends of increasing wildfires in areas with oil and gas wells, increasing numbers of people that are to these things. And we already know that there are people of color in California, at least all more likely to live near these wells. It's projected to continue worsening. So is this something we should worry about? I'm not worried about this. I have convinced myself that we should worry about this. And the highest number of wells at risk are in California, Texas, and Oklahoma, and we're seeing a trend of increasing uh, people exposed in wells in high risk areas in all of these states. Um, notably, many of these wells are on federal land. Tens of thousands of these wells are on federal land. And as many of us know, um, there's ongoing permitting of oil and gas wells on federal land. And I don't, uh, and I would just love to uh, see policymakers and managers take future wildfire risk into account. And just to illustrate that point a little bit, uh, some particularly older wells have been known to emit methane. We're looking into this because we want to get better methane than like we have gas inventories. But guess what? Uh, methane and fire don't mix either. <laughs> and at certain concentrations, of high concentrations of methane, which in some cases have been observed in residential areas. There's 25,000 parts per million methane uh, concentration that with a source of ignition can lead to an explosion. So it's rare, but when you have 1.7 or 1.2 million well in high wildfire risk areas, I think this is something that we should be paying attention to. This is everything I talked about. Um, I do want to leave 
few minutes for questions, but I just want to talk about some of the policies that have emerged in this work, um, including um, a bill signed by Governor Newsom in the fall that created a buffer zone of one kilometer between uh, areas where new wells can be operated or drilled and um, sensitive receptors, including home schools and hospitals. So they cited my work in this, which was amazing. I never expected my dissertation work to like, go on to this, this kind of impact. Uh, of course, many other people who worked outside it as well. Um, and this was led by some really powerful advocacy from frontline community residents. Uh, so it's been a very educational experience for me as an early career researcher to see how the research is translated to policy. Um, and to also see um, how these policies, the, the maneuverings that this industry, the oil and gas industry has taken. Um, in a, what I would argue, or perhaps describe as an anti-scientific stance. Uh, we know that they've denied climate science for decades, their own climate science. And it seems like they're also denying their own internal study on health, uh, where they've known since the 1940s that chemicals associated with oil and gas production were giving their own employees cancer as early as the 1940s and 50s. Um, yet they still are, um, some industry affiliated groups are, um, challenging these evidence-based public health policies. And in fact, uh, collected a bunch of signatures and got that bill that I just told you about. Uh, it will now be a referendum in the state of California in 2024 because California voters in November 24 will decide whether to keep this law or not. And in the meantime, uh, they've issued 600 uh, oil and gas industry uh, operators have requested 600 permits to drill or operate, uh, to drill wells in that buffer zone since this referendum uh, came into effect. So that referendum pauses the law, but a setback protection is currently being on um, So not really the happiest ending, but I think that's how it is. Um, and if, if anything, it's motivation to, uh, to do more research and then also to translate this, these findings to the policymakers, which for this issue are the people of California. So it's something I've been thinking about quite a bit. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, all of the funding agencies and uh, mechanisms that have supported this work. And of course, uh, the community of scholars that I've worked alongside for public public papers. And um, look forward to talking with you all here, or again, I'm moving across the street um, in July. Uh, I hope to continue collaborating with folks in Espen. Um, at the nexus of these, you know, especially climate related issues. So, um, yeah, I guess we have a few minutes for questions. Happy to take them up again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, sorry. Yes. I'm all good. I just had a thanks for just a great presentation. It's amazing to see all the work that you've been doing. Um, my question is about this idea of the one kilometer buffer, and particularly in relation to your first study, where you were seeing like ozone level was actually appearing to move that two plus kilometer. And I wondered if you could comment about, you know, in your later study, you use that one kilometer buffer for the exposure. Um, and even in, then seeing it translated into policy, it seems like that one, was it one mile, one kilometer? One kilometer, law. essentially one kilometer. One kilometer, yeah, buffer in law. And do you think that is the right? Kind of buffer, or you know, from like a scientific perspective, in terms of exposure, um, and you know, what what would what you about on that? And then my second question was about the wildfire study. And I wondered if you could just say kind of what climate scenarios you were using to model future climate uh, or wildfire risk. I think that's sort of like a middle of the road, or if that's an eight point five, or kind of like what climate story is being told with those figures. Love both of these questions. Uh, for the first question, um, here's another paper that um, was led by uh, one of my colleagues at Yale uh, that I contributed to. And we took this hierarchy of controls, uh, the concept from engineering, and applied it to the case of regulating oil and gas. Uh, the most, the best thing to do for public health is to eliminate oil and gas production altogether, full stop. Not only for the health of frontline communities, but also for the health of people uh, that are impacted by climate change. So that's the most effective public health policy. Um, but um, probably not realistic, California, Governor Newsom has said aspirationally that he would like California to become the first jurisdiction in the world to prohibit new drilling. But that obviously will not happen in the short term or the long term thing. 
Um, setbacks are second most effective. So you get people away from where the oil and gas wells are, um, or you get the oil and gas wells away from the people. Um, and then, you know, pollution decays over distance or dilutes, um, and it's better for health. The one kilometer distance is uh, is well supported by the science, um, but it really depends. So it's a really, it depends sort of thing. A lot of the epidemiological studies, including the first study I did, we weren't trying to answer what distance is safe. We we're just trying to see, uh, we used an inverse distance square weighting method where we said, okay, let's count all the oil wells within 10 kilometers. We're gonna say, if you live, if they're closer, we think they're worse. So we're gonna weight those heavier, but we're not looking at different distance bins. Since getting involved with a coalition called Vision, Voices in Solidarity Against Oil and Neighborhoods, advocating for evidence-based policymaking, I was a member of the coalition uh, when I was a PhD student. I was part of their conversations, which was very instructive. <laughs> was on, uh, it was by Zoom, there was someone hopefully rushing to class. Um, so the bathroom is that direction. Um, the, I was part of these conversations where these advocacy organizations, including lawyers and just community residents and concerned citizens, were trying to come up with the distance to bring to their champions in the state legislature. The number at the time was 2,500 feet, which is less than the 3,280 that we're at now, one kilometer. And I remember sitting there and being like, where's this number coming from? Seemed to be, well, supported by some of the studies, but also politically palatable. So it seemed like, uh, and I, I remember being in these conversations being like, well, you know, we have evidence that there's harm further than this distance, but at least these advocates did not think that there was an appetite for, for further protections. Uh, so it's been, again, very fascinating to be a part of this. This is a community-led initiative. Communities have been on the front line of pushing this through, uh, this, through the legislature and getting this issue on Newsom's radar. Um, and so in effect, that's where that came from. I, I think when I remember these groups were pleasantly surprised that they were asking for 2,500 feet, they got 3,200 feet. And the 3,200 feet is well supported by the report that I mentioned earlier, uh, which is still in draft form. Um, but we have a publicly available FAQ where we say that there's very strong evidence that there's harm within one quality, possibly further. But then um, we can talk about this more later, but that's essentially, I could talk about this all day. Um, but that's essentially why we got to that number. With respect to, um, <clears throat> I just messed the whole thing up <laughs> in the share. Um, I uh, am writing that paper this week, and that's the thing I was going to look up earlier today, but didn't have time to, where these numbers came from. So this is from a group at the National, I think, Argonne National, I don't know, whichever one's out there in like the Midwest, the Oak one. Um, as a group at the National Labs, they've done what we hope is a very careful job of estimating uh, this KVDI, this KVDI, this drought virus, and I don't remember what assumptions they made. <laughs> so I'm going to look that up, uh, and I can get you that answer, uh, or I can just refer you to the paper. Uh, but it's not our projection. I'm not. That's not my area of expertise. But we're collaborating with this group at the National Labs who uh, put out this data product that you know we were then able to use. My, I think it was more of a middle of the road sort of thing, um, but I'm not 100% sure. Yes. I have to say that's not sex. Um, two questions. First one being, have you or anyone else looked at, was we do have local setback policies? And I'm curious if anyone's trying to look at the like health benefits, mm -hmm. like even short term things around local setback policies in part as like a politically strategic supportive if like we have to go to local initiatives rather than statewide. So I'm curious, like Arvin comes to mind as a place that has passed local yes. setbacks. Yeah, Arvin's fantastic. Um, yeah, uh, um, so that's the first question. And then the second question is, you have that said, I've been following this session with the bill, but I have not heard it going to the referendum. You have a sense that that's in order to just get these, it's on pause, they'll get these permits in. And they're not going to invest a ton in that campaign, or do you have a sense that they're going to invest a lot in that campaign? And I guess that also speaks to my question about like how the size of the policy nexus and like maybe where you're plugging into that conclusion for it. Yeah. Um, so the first question was about local. Yeah. So there's you know policy making happening at municipal, county, and state levels for this. 
there's been some success at the municipal and county level. So you mentioned Arvin, which is a fantastic example among the first leaders, a majority of Latinx community in Kern County, which took it upon themselves to institute setbacks uh, and against some pretty um, heavy uh, pushback from industry. Um, and their setback was, I think, around 600 feet. Um, and then count, Ventura County voted a couple of years ago to institute a 2,500 foot setback, I believe. Um, the city of Los Angeles and the county of Los Angeles have also uh, uh, adopted new uh, policies which would prohibit drilling on uh, county and city managed land. And I think there might be some additional protection for emissions as well and for operators. Um, so there's some fantastic examples. And then like a good Berkeley scientist, is a natural experiment. We have a treatment pre and post. Uh, the challenge with doing health studies, though, is we need spatially resolved health data with enough statistical power to be able to ask that question. So a city like Arvin, just a few thousand residents, as great as they are, um, it would be very challenging epidemiologically to look to construct that study. Um, thinking more broadly of places like Los Angeles, would potentially be interesting and it's something that uh, I've had in the back of my mind since these policies have gone into place. Uh, there's other ways we can look at this, for example, looking at, you know, I think health is hard. We can look at exposure to pollutants using, you know, these routine regulatory monitors or using like purple air networks, things like that. And it's something that we, we can certainly do uh, if we have the data. And um, I think the, that's a big if, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but the thing that I like to say, uh, if we're saying that there's causal evidence, again, this scientific body has concluded there's causal evidence of harm, that means there's causal evidence that of benefit when we put these policies into place. So I think I would just argue like, you know, we, we can rely on the body of epidemiological evidence to say like, when we put these policies in place, we'll save lives measurably. That's what causal means. Um, but I think more work can be done, and I do plan to continue to stay engaged in this. And I think it's great to have more work because, to your second question, uh, it seems like a chess game at times uh, that industry, at least I've been involved with this issue for uh, about five years now, and uh, different sides of it, working with state regulators, working with community advocacy groups, and then being in the academic space all the while. Um, every it just seems like a chess game between community advocacy groups and their lawyers and industry and their lawyers. Um, and again, this isn't really a scientific answer because this isn't really scientific. Um, and I am not hopeful that science will be at the center of the conversation, at least with respect to the industry. Because in December, after that referendum, after that petition went through and was certified, uh, I think it was certified after that, but they gathered enough signatures, they knew it in December, they issued a press release, some industry affiliated groups, in this press release, they said there is no evidence, no scientific evidence, quote, no scientific evidence for that policy, which is just denying the existence of uh, not only 60 epidemiological studies, including five conducted in California, um, but um, the, this report to these experts that the state of California paid for. Um, there's uh, there's so much evidence out there, but there you know this in this single press release uh, they said there's no evidence for it. So it's, it was interesting to see. Um, there's also allegations that when they're collecting petitions that the, the signature collectors lie to people, uh, which is very concerning. Um, and then obviously the oil industry has has been very effective in the in the climate space of denying science and challenging the science. So I wonder if we're seeing something similar when it comes to health here. I plan to be very involved with this, and I think it's incumbent upon us as uh, you know UC scientists to make sure that our science is out there and, and communicated accurately. How to do that? I've been in conversation with some colleagues, but I'm very interested to continue thinking about this, especially with folks uh, that have thought about this more than I have. I think we might be over time, um, but I'm happy to stick around. And keep... Did that did that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great, and I'd love to talk to you. Um, and I'm just going to check the chat and just see if people are saying nice things or asking questions. <laughs> they were saying nice things. Thank you, guys. <laughs> um, <laughs> great. Yeah, thank you.